Welcome, Bridge Builders. On today's episode, we interview a very special guest named Johnny Alder, who is an author of a new book called Closeted, My Life as a Gay BYU Student. Um, this was a great interview. Absolutely loved talking to Johnny. We did go a little bit over our usual hour time limit, um, so you notice this is almost closer to an hour and a half, but I think it's well worth it for the conversation that we have. Um, one thing quickly before get into the show for today... Um, in post-production, I was listening to the audio levels and they did not pick up well on the microphones that we had here in studio. So I'm using the audio from the video that I recorded. Um, this video is going to be on YouTube as well. So recognize that I wish the audio was a little bit better quality. So I apologize for that. And, um, one other thing is... That Garrett, our usual co-host here with us, he was not feeling well, so it was just an interview with me and Johnny. So, we appreciate you guys for tuning in, for listening. If you aren't subscribed to us on YouTube, I would ask that you go there and just click that subscribe button. You don't even need to listen there necessarily if you'd not, if you'd prefer to have your podcast in the audio format only, but just by having more subscribers, that can help us just reach a bigger, bigger audience and feed more into the algorithms that YouTube has. So... Thanks for tuning in. We appreciate your um, support. And just as always, please remember we're not experts on religion, theology, or Mormonism. Any views expressed herein belong to those who made the statement and do not necessarily reflect the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints or its membership. Welcome, Bridge Builders, to the podcast for today. Uh, we have a very special guest here, and we're missing one of our co-hosts as well. So I've got Johnny Alder, Jonathan Alder, as my co-host today. He is the author of a new book called Closeted, My Life as... Dang it. <laughs> you got to say it for me. It's Closeted, My Life as a Gay BYU Student. Okay, there we go. <laughs> book came out in October, is that right? Yes. And the audiobook just came out like a couple weeks ago. Yep. Cool. Just barely came out. Awesome. Um, yeah, we're missing Garrett today. He's feeling a little bit under the weather, so it's just going to be us two, but we're excited to have you here, Johnny. Thanks for coming on the show. Sounds good. Thanks for having me. Yeah. We wanted to uh, get a little bit of your brief personal history with the church and... Talk a little bit also about the book and what made you want to write it, what um, what you cover in the book, like parts of your life and stuff. Maybe share with us some things that you don't cover in the book if you feel comfortable with that and stuff like that. So, yeah. <laughs> cool. Sounds good. Okay. Do you want me to lead it? Yeah. No, go ahead. <clears throat> okay. You want to start? So, yeah, I uh, born and raised in Utah, um, was a member of the church my whole life. Um, I guess... Maybe let's just dive right into the experience of being uh, gay, because I think that's where, where it becomes relevant, <laughs> is, is right there in childhood. So, I mean, there's there's obviously, um, at least for me, uh, and, and I guess I should obviously preface and give a disclaimer that my experience is not going to be everyone's experience. Uh, everyone's going to have a unique experience and, um, you know, just have their own personal interactions and outcomes with all the things that we're going to talk about. Um, but my experience was knowing very young, um, I guess at first that there was something different that how I was experiencing things was, uh, somehow different from, you know, what was expected or, or I was told to, to expect in terms of like, you know, uh, becoming attracted to girls over time and, and things like that. So, I mean, I don't know, it's very standard, I suppose, on, in that way, just kind of, uh, realizing the dichotomy over time as a, as a child, uh, growing up gay and, and, uh, realizing, I suppose, that that was a problem <laughs> with, with the, uh, world around me, I suppose. Yeah. Is, is, it is, conflicted is, with your world made right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I, I go into that quite in depth because I, uh, in the book, I should say, uh, because I just feel like that's really the stage of life that it's the most difficult is when you are alone and no one's there telling you what's going on or why things are different or why you seem to be a threat mm -hmm. and you haven't told anyone. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, it's, yeah, it's tricky being in that situation. I, I, I don't know. I guess that's all I really have to say about, uh, childhood is just knowing, knowing there was something fundamentally different. Um, 
going into high school was um, tricky. Uh, obviously, uh, you've fully realized kind of what the situation is and the lot that you've been dealt, even if you know you're you're uh, still in a little bit of denial about the reality of the situation. And um, I think that I, along with many of my kind of queer, queer counterparts, uh, experience kind of some onsets of suicidal ideation at this point in time. Mm -hmm. Um, but for me personally, um, I, uh, largely was able to ignore that after I graduated high school, when I went on my mission, I had a very good, uh, in my, in my, (laughs) I had a very good, uh, mission experience overall. It was, it was good. Um, and then I, uh, went to BYU and went a year there uh, without any problems, um, mostly no problems, I guess I should clarify, because there was something about that first year that kind of shifted something within me, kind of a failure to engage with like dating in any serious capacity. Um, and that kind of began to open me up to the idea that like, you know, maybe, maybe the way that I thought life was going to work out isn't going to work out that way. And that was a reality that I really began to confront after that first year at BYU. And then, and then, (laughs) and then the second year at BYU happened. And that's the year that the uh, book focuses on, um, I I guess I was under the impression that was your first year that what was all going on. So maybe maybe I miss yeah I misread that part. Well, I mean that's that's really where the book picks up is 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 in that second year. A um, little bit glossed over in the in the first year. Gotcha. Um, okay. Just because yeah, it was it was a slower year, but but um, in the second year <laughs> a lot happens. <laughs> a lot happens. Um, so I guess a laundry list of items. Can I do that without sounding insensitive? <laughs> it's, um, your, it's your life. It's your book. Right? <laughs> so I guess we'll just start out like the book does in the deep end. Yeah. So it uh, begins with my uh, girlfriend um, deciding that our relationship was going to turn sexual. And she began um, assaulting me regularly throughout the course of a month. Um I guess back up just a little bit. I got a girlfriend. Um, (laughs) And that, that was a very, very abusive relationship on just about every level. Um, It was physically abusive, sexually abusive, emotionally abusive. Um, There was a lot of condescension and gaslighting. And during, during that time, I attracted the attention of, well, no, I shouldn't say it like that because she she brought us in <laughs> to to our bishop and got me on his radar, and things kind of snowballed from there because I was coming to accept myself when we broke up. I jumped right into gay dating and um, had some experiences, which then got onto my bishop's radar, and because I was already being kind of followed up with about the things that she had already done. Right. Sorry, this is very all over the place. No, it's good. It's, <laughs> the book is, first off, I just wanted to say that as a reader, I guess a listener, I listened to the audiobook and I just loved it. So thank you for writing what you did. And I'm sure you're going to be helping a lot of people by, by writing this. So. No, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Um, and yeah, sorry if I've taken over here. <laughs> no, <it isn't. laughs> you're good. No, but um, okay. So uh, yeah, it just kind of snowballed from there because I was on my bishop's radar because of uh, my ex girlfriend now, um, and started dating men, and then had to you know be secretive and uh, just kind of sneak around, but also my bishop kind of knew and um, consequences ensued. Yeah. <laughs> and the mental health issues that came up with this as well. The mental health all kinds of stuff going on. The November 2015 policy was also right in the midst of this, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. So Very a good. lot of stuff happening all at the same time in your life down at BYU. So. Yeah. Yeah. And the November 5th policy change um, 
happened one day before I went on my first image. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so that was a very interesting kind of dichotomy because I was fully, like, emotionally unprepared to parse through what was happening. And it was, it felt like a really big deal because it felt like everyone on social media was talking about it. I don't, I don't know how it was from, from your perspective. Um, but were you on your mission at that point in time? No, I, I left on my mission when I was 22. Uh-huh. I was quite a bit older, so I left in 2016, the end of 2016. Oh, oh I didn't know that. Um, but okay. around this time is when I started to personally get a little bit more involved in the church and really try to like work towards going on a mission. And I, I was curious, actually, a couple months ago, I went back and scrolled all the way back to around that time period if I posted anything. And I did put something along the lines of like, I don't, the only thing that comes to me right now is trust God. And like, yeah. that's all I put, because at the time I remember I was in St. George on a trip with some friends. This is mm-hmm. me just getting into the details. I don't know why. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, we were just like driving back home, I think from St. George. And I like, I was seeing it on Facebook start to blow up and stuff. And everybody's kind of freaking out. Some people are really trying to defend the church. Other people are really trying to attack it. I'm just kind of like on the sidelines, like, I don't know how this fits in. But at the time, I was very much under the belief that God literally spoke this to the prophet. So God has his reasons kind of thing. Um, But yeah, it was tough to grapple with at the time. And when they reversed it four years later, then kind of had to grapple with that too. And to this day, it's still a question that is kind of circulating. Why did that happen? What was the purpose? Where did it come from? Why are we here? Where are we going? (laughs) (laughs) Oh well, yeah, so, and I don't. I don't personally. I, I haven't really been very closely involved with the church for for a while, but I don't think there's been anything quite like that sense in terms of like the reaction and the discourse and the level of engagement that people were willing to uh, put out there with it. Mm -hmm. So, so that was very, very, uh, confusing and difficult, (laughs) I guess, to say the least, because I was, I was so new to everything and I was still figuring out what my opinions were. And I didn't really have the time to process a lot of that. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so that, that was interesting. And just in terms of like lining up with that period of transition in my life. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess, long story short, because I know this is only a section of this episode, but long story short, um, I ended up having a disciplinary council and ultimately ended up leaving BYU after that year. And um, so, uh, around that time, ended up just stopping going to church altogether. Yeah. Um, that that year. Just everything that happened, it was like I, I was just burned out and wasn't even ready to really think through things. I just had to stop. Yeah, for sure. So, and then um, met my current husband, uh, current husband, I don't know why I said it like that. <laughs> I've never been married before. So. There you go. <laughs> I met you my met your husband James. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I met my husband James uh while at USU. Um we've been together for uh, six and a half years, I think. Um yeah, uh August 2016. And then we got married in October 2022. So newlyweds, but we've <laughs> there you go. <laughs> we've been together for a bit. And you guys have the cutest dog. I will yes. see pictures so far. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Person, so. We'll have to invite you over so you can get Awesome. That's so cool. Thank you for sharing. Um, yeah. Dang, I had a thought in my head. What was it? Oh, go Aggies. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. Well, I, so. I loved wearing my BYU shirt with my Aggies hat yeah. and just <laughs> making everyone angry. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, cool. Um, tell us where people can buy or listen to the book. So the book uh, is... If you want it on ebook, it's primarily available on Amazon just because um, Amazon's the 
Sorry, the place to <laughs> sell your stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. So primarily it's available on Amazon uh, for, for all digital copies. You can also buy it on paper back there. But if you want a signed copy, uh, my website's the best place to do it. It's just jonathan-alder.com. Um, there's there's signed copies available there. And then uh, the audiobook is available pretty much on every single uh, audiobook retailer site. Uh Audible, uh, Apple Books, Google Books, Kobo, uh, even Spotify now has audiobooks. Yeah, so something's about cool. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. They oh. bought a retailer recently, and now they have all of the audiobooks. So. There you go. <laughs> um, we'll be sure to add your website into our show notes and stuff where Thanks. people can purchase it. Um, cool. Well, that's the book. Once again, I just want to like throw out there. I loved it personally. Um, I think while I was reading it, something and you mentioned this at the beginning of the audio book, at least like a trigger warning for some certain things. Yes. Um, there are some more mature themes throughout the book, um, some mature language as well and sexual abuse, stuff like that. And so people should be aware of that, I think before they get into it and stuff, but yeah, overall, yeah, for sure. great. Okay. Um, cool. Well, I wanted to move into the bulk of our interview, just kind of like the meat of it and just talk about bridge building with LGBTQ people, because this is something that, as most of our listeners know, they're affiliated with the Latter-day Saint Church in some capacity or were, and um, it, to put it very, what's the word, not bluntly, um, to put it lightly, it is very difficult to be a queer person in the Latter-day Saint Church, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I wanted to get your perspective a little bit on helping maybe those who are straight or cis- and or cisgendered to understand what it may feel like to be someone who is queer and a Latter-day Saint at the same time. Yeah. If you wanted to touch on that a little bit. Yeah. Um, well, I think um, just on the subject of kind of uh, bridge building and coming to a common understanding, if I can, if I can back up just a, yeah, just a second, um, that was really one of the main goals, I suppose, in the writing of the book is um, getting people, guiding people in an uh, inoffensive, digestible way through the thought process of how someone can rationally arrive at where they end up as yeah. a, a queer member of the church or if they, if they leave as an ex-member of the church, um, just seeking understanding in that space and the headspace and the thought process and how it can be a good thing for people um, to either step back from, from a situation or, or go in a situation or go in a direction that you may not fully understand. Um, there's a process behind that and it's not entirely, um, easily accessible Mm -hmm. to someone who hasn't gone through that process. And it's, I think that's the first step is just, understanding and recognizing that I may not understand this thing, but I don't have to understand this thing Sure. to recognize that it's real and rational to this person experiencing it. Yeah. And um, they may have gone in a direction that I don't currently understand, but they made the right decision for them and they're in a better place physically and emotionally for it. Definitely. Um, so I, I, I would say that that's, that's the main thing is coming to that place of understanding and um, sorry, uh, coming, coming to that place of understanding and really just, you know, acceptance of this is real, it's happening and it's happening for a reason um, for this person. Um, and so I think that, I guess, on, on, on the subject of 
coming to an understanding and then um, being an ally to the queer community. Um, it's really just important to come from that place of understanding and and in terms of allyship, um, that's kind of kind of the general, I guess, topic of 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 this discussion. Mm -hmm. um, I guess before we really uh, dive into this, I I, I just want to kind of talk about the concept of allyship and and what it is and 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 what it looks like because yeah. so so I think in its simplest terms, allyship is going to be. Um, supporting the queer community, um, supporting the gay person or transgender person or lesbian in your life um, in some capacity. And I think that what that looks like is really gonna be just dependent on the situation. Um, because support looks like many things <laughs> yeah, sure. in many situations. And neutrality looks like many things. Right. And opposition looks like many things. Um, and I think, you know, even outside of the queer community, this is, this is one of the biggest things that you have to grapple with in life is these concepts of, support and communication and finding people who validate you and who see your worth. Um, it's not that single thing is, is really not a, uh, you know, queer or gay issue. It's, it's a, it's an issue of human connection. Yeah. It's an um, issue of humanity, right? To understand and support someone who is different than you in yeah. some aspect, right? Yeah. And we're all different. I yeah. mean, <laughs> can find the person that you're closest to in terms of interests and beliefs, and there will still be differences. Right. And some, some chosen, some not, right? I think that's another thing. Too. Some, sorry? Some chosen and some not, right? You, mm -hmm. know, you could choose like what political party, for yeah. instance, you're part of, but choosing your sexuality, that's not a thing. Yeah, 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 that's a good point. Is that like, with being gay specifically, this is a, an immutable characteristic. Right. Um, and so those are just kind of things that if you disagree, <laughs> if that's even how, a, how you can use that word, but if you disagree with my immutable characteristic, we're kind of at an impasse. Like, right. like what, do you, what do you do? Like, I disagree with you having blue eyes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. I also think of, there's a lot of, <clears throat> one of the um, cliches I hear, if, if you've heard some of our past episodes, we do the tackling cliches kind of thing, and mm -hmm. there's one that's coming to my mind right now is the uh, the gay lifestyle. Right? Yes. <laughs> that's, a, that's a cliche if I've ever heard one. Yeah. Um, when, in reality, I was listening to a TED Talk one time, and this person um, grew up LDS, then decided to become an ally. Uh -huh. and he was like, learning the quote unquote gay lifestyle was my friend, so and so, I forgot who he talked about, but um, a co worker of his. And he's like, Do you want to know what my gay lifestyle is? This gay man was saying <laughs> to him, He's like, I go home, I do the dishes and cook dinner with my husband. And if we have some time, we watch some TV and then we like go to bed and go to work the next day. And it's like, Yeah. You know, like, That's, how is how would someone feel if, how would a straight person feel if someone like came up to me like, you know what, I just don't support your lifestyle being married to that person <laughs> and like your family and like everything that you're doing. That's just, that doesn't jive with like what yeah. I was taught. Like, come on, you know, like, yeah. Flipping the script on yourself. I think that's something for me personally that has helped me understand more how to be an ally. Yeah. Like, how would it feel if I was being asked to do X, Y, and Z when we're so comfortable saying X, Y, and Z needs to be done to a queer person? Or yeah. They need to live that way or something. Yeah. And I was just going to say that uh, what you described as the, as the gay lifestyle sounds a lot like my life. You know? Yeah. <laughs> just, we, uh, we're married. We have a house. We both have jobs and we yeah. have a dog and... 
we like to watch TV shows sometimes. And <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's normal, right? Like, yeah. I think that's a big thing is like, we need to normalize mm-hmm. things because it's easy to get this mindset. Oh, everyone's so different. And you have this image that's in your head, whether it was beaten into you for lack of a better term mm-hmm. or whatever, just by not understanding. It's like, I honestly have no idea what most Hindu people's lifestyle is because I just don't really yeah. interact with that very often, but like I want to, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? And you can maybe just like project what you're already thinking is like what someone's lifestyle is when in reality you could be completely wrong. You yeah. Know what I mean, yeah. So. And, in, and in terms of lifestyle, I think, I think that's also kind of an interesting discussion because I think that there are things that could be considered lifestyle if we can detach the, not about being gay. Sure. <laughs> if, if we can det- if we can detach the negative connotations of that word with how it's levied against the queer community, mm-hmm. there are things that are lifestyle choices, like the choice for me and my husband not to have any kids. That's in my thought, that could be a lifestyle choice, or for sure. someone in the queer community to live a polyamorous life or not not be in a monogamous relationship right that could be a lifestyle choice but why is why do we need to apply a judgment right to that um people people are gonna do the best thing for them Mm -hmm. and lives may look different based on different choices and things that they they decide to do but that's it's not a bad thing yeah i'm thinking like just flipping that script you know like on regular true believing latter-day saint family like how would you feel if someone came up to you and was like i don't like your lifestyle of having a family prayer every day you know Mm -hmm. and like that you go to church every sunday it's like that's what i'm choosing to do right this is me and my family our choice i'm not harming anyone else by doing this yeah, I would hope you know. Yeah, um, things can always be taken to extremes in and out of religion and everywhere in between and stuff. But um, I think at the end of the day, as long as you're not harming other people, things are consensual. Like, is there an issue? Yeah, I think the discussion of or the idea of harm is really kind of the key here. Is that when there is no harm being done. And it could be argued that preventing Mm -hmm. someone from living how they choose could cause harm when there's no harm being done and there, there could be harm done (laughs) if not permitted. Right. Then what, what's the issue? Yeah, for sure. And you talking before a little bit, you talked a little bit about like, we have these fears sometimes when we project our fears of stuff. And I'm just thinking, you know, I've heard the rhetoric of, what is it? There's something incredibly stupid that has been said um the downfall of rome was homosexuality or something yeah yeah yeah, yeah. it's like like this stuff where it's like oh if we let gay people get married all of a sudden like that's just going to crumble the united states or something like that like you just that slippery soap fallacy like 101 yeah yeah and you know stuff like that so people project fears onto all kinds of stuff like that and it's not helpful to the conversation yeah for sure i mean i think one of the biggest negative discussions that I consistently see is the, and it, and it takes many forms, but, mm-hmm. but condensed into its uh, purest form. I, I like to think of it as like the social contagion theory mm-hmm. that queer people are some kind of social contagion and it's going to spread or something. Exposure to gay people or trans people is a way that queerness propagates <laughs> essentially <laughs> it's um, not covid right it's yeah right. yeah yeah exactly well and, and i think that that's just such a kind of dangerous kind of insidious idea yeah um because you have someone who's motivated to not only stop homosexuality but thinks they can right and I think they're morally justified in doing so, mm-hmm. right? And that's a very dangerous path to go down. Um, I was laughing in my head a second ago because part of your book, you describe um, the gay agenda and being like taken into it, right? <laughs> and it's a tongue-in-cheek reference for sure, but it's 
it got me cracking up pretty good. If I remember right, it was um, the your non-disclosure gay, agreement that you had. gay onboarding <laughs> packet with the non-disclosure agreement. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, the only purpose of heterosexual people is to like promulgate the population, but besides that, everybody else needs to be. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, it's, it's the, the great demotion of heterosexuality is that you're all actually under control of the the gays. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we laughed pretty good. That was, that was a good part. Um, yeah. I don't know. I feel like we've kind of touched on this a little bit. Is there, what was the next thing that you had written down that you wanted to talk about? Was... Yeah. So um, I had a couple of thoughts and just like allyship in general. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, you kind of, kind of going back and touching on that subject. Allyship in its purest form is just going to be supporting the queer community. Right. And it's going to look different in different situations. Right, right, right. And yeah. also, when you ask the gay person, it's gonna their their answer is going to be biased towards their personal experiences and what they've experienced and what they believe is discrimination leveled against them. For sure. And my experience is going to look different from another person in another marginalized community. Um, and that's just I feel like that should be addressed in some ways. That, right. My experience is not representative of everyone. Sure. Um, but one of the one of the things that I wrote down for allyship is to accept the feelings and trauma and the potential for damage without defensiveness. Mm-hmm. Um, sorry. Yeah, you're good. <laughs> <clears throat> Just gotta put my jacket on because I feel myself like mildly shivering and I don't want my voice to be shaken. <laughs> it does get kind of cold in this room. <laughs> I get cold easy. Okay, so um yeah, so one of one of the things, one of one of the main things that I think is useful is uh to accept the feelings, accept the trauma, accept the potential for damage without becoming defensive. Um and to just accept that the life experience may be different than yours or what you perceived their life experience to be. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the form this takes is, it takes a couple of forms. Um, the, the big one that I think you see in the, kind of the cliche is like the parent of a queer child saying that they were such a happy child and they probably were a happy child, but, <laughs> but saying they were such a happy child, and then they became gay. <laughs> right. And now they're not happy, so being gay is the problem. Yeah. Um, and that childhood may have been quite different to experience than to observe. And that's not the parents' fault. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that's that's really the key, is that... <sighs> no one's necessarily at fault here right except for perhaps society just at large but no one's no one's to blame here but that child is going to have trauma Mm -hmm. and trauma trauma is not necessarily the experience itself but the result of that experience right and so listening to what they have to say listening to the the hurt and saying like this aspect of my childhood was very damaging. And for a parent, that's really hard to hear. For sure. And that's understandable. It's, it's, it's hard. And it's a hard discussion <laughs> that <laughs> no one is prepared for. Right. <laughs> um, but just listening to that and accepting that and realizing that fault isn't being placed here. It just happened. <laughs> um, I think that's a crucial part in like the parent child interaction and navigating that. Um, yeah. Another thing, um, if I could add one thing, go ahead really too quick too. Um, sometimes I hear this not so much with queer, um, talk, if that's a, <laughs> queer talk or, um, <laughs> Sounds like, like a radio show. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like the, that hasn't been my experience cliche. You know yes, I mean? like I feel yes. like that. Have you heard that much, well, yeah. like with your yeah and stuff like that? The the response can be, oh, this thing 
was really hurtful and damaging. And then, and then the response is, well, I didn't feel yeah. that way. <laughs> right. <laughs> what are you talking about? Just, yeah. So it can be yeah. very dismissive. I think unintentionally for the most part, people are just like, oh, that just, that wasn't what I said or what I experienced, but yeah. Holding that empathy for just a minute at least. And just being like, I can understand how that would be difficult for you. Yeah. Um, I saw a TikTok the other day that really just like helped open my eyes in a lot of ways. It from a, as far as I can tell, he's a member of the church and still active and stuff. Uh huh. And maybe I don't know if you saw the same one. It's kind of it's a possible. Pop, popular. I've got one in my mind. <laughs> um, but basically, he says if if I marry a man, I betray my religion. But if I marry a woman, I betray myself. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And yeah. that just like hit a chord with me because I was just like, man, how could you? How could you make that choice? And I. I, I just couldn't even like put myself in his shoes completely, but it just like, I just, my heart ached for him. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I did, I did see that one and I, I thought a long time about um, stitching it, but I just didn't, I wasn't sure that I could say anything. Right. Um, because it's like, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and that's, that's the, that's the hard thing because like going, going back, earlier to when we were talking about like the policy change and the stage of my life that that happened during and to see like people online basically like throwing out all of my internalized thoughts about being gay Mm -hmm. on Facebook and I had no idea what I believed in or how to reconcile any of those things yeah it sucks (laughs) it does and so I, I feel for that person um and I don't even, I, I don't have the answer <laughs> yeah. because it's like, I, I know, I know what I did. I know how I got to be in a place where I'm okay. And of course me internally, I'm going to think that my answer is probably just going to work for you too, but, right. but it's not fair for me to say that because maybe it won't. Yeah. Maybe it won't work. That's like one of our catchphrases on this show is we're not the expert on another person's journey, right? Mm-hmm. Like what may work for me probably doesn't work for a lot of other people you know what i mean Mm -hmm. and it's it's the concept of recognizing that we have a very like egocentric view of the world ourselves Mm -hmm. being the ego center to the universe and everything revolves around us therefore answers that work for us must therefore work for other people right they just (laughs) they just don't yeah exactly um yeah um do you want me to go oh, yeah, to the on. next one? Sure. Um, okay, so the next one I think is is pretty important, um, and it's difficult. Um, so it's it's learning to recognize and work through your own internalized homophobia, and I want to take a second to dissect that just a little bit because I feel like the words like homophobia or, or racism, they can be interpreted in very defensive ways. Mm -hmm. And it, it's understandable, but also it's, it's good to just kind of take a second and breathe and realize that it's not necessarily an attack because we all have internalized homophobia. Right. And I would, I would say that <clears throat> from my perspective, um, I had a lot of internalized homophobia growing up. Um, I, <laughs> I, I remember on occasion, I would, I would really surprise some of my gay friends by saying like, I was really homophobic growing up mm-hmm. and they'd be like, what? what are you talking about? And I would just be like, well, yeah, I was, I was really homophobic. Like I didn't, I didn't accept myself. I was, I was all these things I had, I had beliefs about um, being gay. I wasn't accepting of it. And then, and then eventually we get to a point where they're like, oh, I guess I was homophobic too. <laughs> right. And, and so it's, it's not, it's not a bad thing. It is a bad thing, but it's not a bad thing. <laughs> We're not responsible. It's, it's something to recognize and then move past. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily something I need to dwell on. It's like, you know, I think of myself too. I used very homophobic language as a teenager. Yeah. And I just didn't 
I didn't, I knew better, but I didn't know better at the same time. And then as I grew and matured and I recognized, you know, that was wrong. Yeah. Now I make steps to make restitution and apologize to those that I perhaps hurt and stuff. So yeah, I think this just kind of goes with it too, but yeah, internalize even a gay person that maybe sounds foreign to like you were saying, like other gay people, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I confuse it that, but even like straight cisgender people also be like, what? Yeah. Um, I took a, a class a couple years ago and it was uh, diversity and healthcare kind of thing. Okay. So we had like different modules on all kinds of different marginalized groups. And we watched this video and it was like a NPR or something report, something like that. And these, this happened in the early 2000s or something. And this is kind of, I won't get into the details, but very graphic murder of a gay man. Uh -huh. And it comes out that the two people that murdered this gay man were also gay. Okay. If that makes sense. I just had to process it. Yeah, yeah. The, the victim who died was openly gay. And then these two were uh -huh. known to go to gay bars and stuff like that. And just the level of internalized homophobia that took it that far to murder. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And I, I don't know. It's hard for me to wrap my brain around at first, but then I was just like, I maybe see this with some of the people that I know, like not to that extent by any means, I'm not saying that, but yeah, we, the system that we're in, at least here in the United States, very Christian, especially if you grew up LDS, right? Gay and gayness isn't seen as a good thing. Yeah. And, or it's not, at the very least, it's not seen as the normal, you know what I mean? Yeah. Anything that's not normal is therefore, in a sense, bad. Mm -hmm. Or, and then having to work past that. I don't know where my thoughts are going and stuff, but no, I, that makes I, sense. I, I get, I get it. Um, I think that one, this is slightly off topic from like discussions around the church, but um, there's a lot of discussions around media and, and, um, the quality of content that's coming out on like in movie theaters and on streaming platforms and stuff like that. Right. And there's a lot of like, I guess, uh, critique that like this show is, is bad. And, but, but, but when you have a personal, when you have a person critiquing media and shows that has a lot of internalized homophobia or racism, they're going to say it's bad because there's gay people in it. Right. It's bad because that's all the writers were focused on. Yeah. And they don't they don't seem to realize that we've had bad TV <laughs> for a long time. Right, yeah. It's not the reason it's bad is because it's bad writing. Right. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's not because they insert I mean maybe they did, but but that's not the reason. The reason it's bad is because it's bad writing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, representation, right? Like, for pretty much the entire history of media since movies, right? Films um, and such. Gayness, queer people, trans people weren't represented. Mm -hmm. At least in a, yeah, there's in like, a good way. <laughs> there's a whole history behind right. that of, like, queer cinema and and symbols and coding and queer coded characters. It's, mm -hmm. it's a very long history of just kind of complicated ways of showing without showing and, right. and, and different symbols would mean certain things, but you couldn't come out and say it. it's, it's, it's really interesting because even like in, in, in literature and, and books, um, some of my favorite, you know, fantasy series um, began in the '90s and didn't have any gay characters. And um, you'd get to the final books released in the 2010s, yeah. And suddenly there would be gay characters in them because it's like, and 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 some people respond by saying, "Oh, the author went woke," you know. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> of course, the woke mob strikes again. <laughs> Um, but really, it was just an issue of those authors weren't allowed to put in those gay characters. Yeah. And they um, 
they, the, the, <laughs> the example I'm thinking specifically of, I guess, um, is, is Will of Time, which was finished by Brandon Sanderson, who's a Mormon author. And he just very, like, I, I don't know, he very flippantly was just like, yeah, this character's gay. Weren't you paying attention? <laughs> <laughs> sure. And I just, it, it's funny because it wasn't, it wasn't allowed. It yeah. wouldn't get published. Right. And I think this is just kind of going back, right? It's the, what, what is considered normal, right? In society and cultures, whether it's within a religious culture or just a country's culture or whatever. Um, and yeah, this internalized homophobia that can come. I, I personally think that it's more widespread than just within yes. Mormonism, right? Yes, for sure. So, um, but yeah, going back to, we kind of got a little bit of a tangent, but. Yeah, um, I have to find my spot again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this one is difficult for me to explain in a way that may be productive. Um, so I hope I hope this makes sense, but um, it's about projecting fears onto the queer person in your life. Um, when a gay person comes out, they've been through a long process, and coming out, I would assume, in the majority of cases, represents at least some level of recognition maybe not self-acceptance but at least some level of recognition mm -hmm. um if it's intentional I just, <laughs> sure. I should say. <laughs> um they've probably thought quite a lot about it they probably are very aware of the difficulties and the potential dangers and uh, discriminations um and it is getting better but it's it's still there and what they need in that moment when they've come out is not just your acceptance, but your willingness to work with them. If you lead with your fears, it can be very difficult to misinterpret that as a lack of support of like, leading with the fear of like, well, let me back up. It's really easy to have a fear and then communicate something that's motivated by that fear, but the thing you're communicating isn't, isn't the actual fear. Um, so that can look like a parent discouraging a child from being gay. But really what that parent is feeling is fear. Yeah. And if... If they can take a moment to recognize that and recognize it's not that I'm trying to restrict my child, it's that I know what the world is yeah. <laughs> and I'm trying, I, I want to protect my child. Lead with that. Lead with that. Instead of, instead of leading with the fear, lead with the concern and say, this may be new to me but we're going to, I'm going to work to understand this. Mm -hmm. I'm going to work to accept what's going on here. And I have fears of what you have and are going to face. Yeah. So easy to flip the script and lead with the fear, but the fear is buried in something that looks like a lack of support. Sure. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so there's that. Um, next thing is church doctrines. <laughs> yeah. We're not going to get into any uh, truth claims or anything, anything like that. Um, but there are some church doctrines that I think are tricky for queer people. Mm -hmm. And the one specifically that I had a hard time with and that I think a lot of people have a hard time with is the idea that we just don't know all the answers in this life and things are going to be revealed and made whole in the next life. Um, 
I think for a lot of people, that's a very comforting doctrine for a lot of reasons and a lot of use cases. Yeah, for sure. I think for someone to hear that their whole lives who believes they're fundamentally flawed and fundamentally unable to make certain progress in this life to get married, to uh, have children, have a family, there's it's a big impediment to that. Um, that doctrine kind of incents suicidal ideation. And I recognize that it's not intentional, maybe, but the result is the result. Yeah. It's the implicit teaching of that doctrine, right? Not the, maybe the explicit. Yeah. Um, that if you believe that you're broken in some ways and that thing that's broken in you is your very identity and that that will be changed, I mean, it's hard to... Yeah, it's hard to think where else that leads to, right? Yeah. And I know there's, and sometimes I see this as like a hot topic issue, like what's the actual data say, right? Because I think that is, data is important for sure, but anecdotally, I, and you, you shared this with me a couple weeks ago, right? You don't know a single queer person that hasn't dealt with suicidal ideation, right? Yeah. To some degree. Yeah, I, I, I genuinely don't think I do. Yeah. Um, and I think, it's, I think it's tricky because I think that that idea can actually be weaponized against the queer community and saying like being suicidal is somehow intrinsic to being gay. Sure. Yeah. I don't believe that matches up with my experience, and I don't believe that matches up with any research that we have. Yeah. Everything that we know suggests that a, an affirming environment reduces suicidality. Right. And that even just one ally in a person's life growing up reduces suicide by so many percentage points. I'm not going to pull out a number because I don't know what that is. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I hate when people do that. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, I mean, that's why conversion therapy is now banned, right? Yeah. At least in Utah, across other states, it's starting to as well, because it, and there's just, there's these stories, right? You cover the story of, was it Matt, what, oh, what is his name? He was in his pickup truck, right? He was a BYU student. And yes. Yeah. Um, His story was also covered in Mormon No More. Yeah. His last name was Fisher, Harry Fisher. Harry Fisher, that's right. And there's other stories where from what took place in the scene, it appears to me that these individuals took that doctrine to heart so much so that they felt like the only option they had was to end their life. Yeah. And I think me personally, you know, there's the debates of like, does God exist? What, what does happen after this life? All that stuff. End of the day, you can say that, you know, for a fact, nobody actually knows for a fact. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and all I know is that here and now, this is my, this is reality. Right. Or at least what I perceive as reality. There's all kinds of things you can get into with that, but end of the day, I want my friends and family to be here with me as long as they possibly can. Yeah. And I think that's why I feel strongly about these issues. Yeah. And why I get upset when people point to members of the church, sometimes even like prominent members of the church who end up coming out as queer or gay or something or trans and that person decides to step back for their own safety, probably. Mm -hmm. That's at least one of the big motivating factors, I would assume. Mental and, health is part of yeah, safety. Right. And, and we point at that person and say, you're wrong. What are you doing? 
X, Y, Z, there's all kinds of things that are being said. And I don't like that. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know. And I think this kind of ties tangentially in with another thing that you talked about in a past episode of stakes of belief. Um, there's very low stakes, high reward for right. a straight person involved with the church. Yeah. And if the church is true, then it's very close to being a no-brainer that you should follow what the church teaches. Yeah. You could have ideological differences and complaints, but it's like, I mean, if the church was true, you should just follow. Yeah. <laughs> Duh, Johnny, don't you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the stakes are so much higher yeah. for a gay person because life looks so different mm -hmm. under that condition. And so what looks like an no-brainer for a straight faithful member of the church may be quite different to an equally faithful gay member of the church right because the stakes of being wrong are incredibly high yeah because it's either a life of your choosing here and separation from your family afterward right or a little bit of sacrifice up front and eternity eternity right yeah that episode um I think it was the why do some people try to stay members of the church right mm -hmm. and i definitely came when i made that statement that definitely came from a place of privilege where for me as a straight white person someone who isn't marginalized in the church it was very low risk for me just to be like oh i could and the person that i was thinking of that said that to me also was in a similar situation so um and i i I don't think you did anything wrong in saying it. Like, sure. it actually helped me frame that statement in a way that, like, you feel that, you know? Mm -hmm. You feel that on some level, and then someone puts it into words, and it's like, okay, yeah, now I know how to explain it. Sure. And I feel like that's the moment I had with that, is like, yeah, it is a, is it a, it, <laughs> it is a, a trade-off of stakes. Yeah. Of risk and reward. Mm -hmm. And it becomes very high stakes when suddenly you realize my life uh, could go very drastically different ways right. um, based on, you know, just choices that I make. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> um, So another thing that I kind of want to touch on is uh, just the idea of the queer community in general. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to understand that the queer community is not a united front, yeah. just as... <laughs> they don't have a president, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> Unless there's some secret that you're keeping from us all, right? Well, we did sign that that non-disclosure <laughs> so i unfortunately right. cannot tell you okay all right <laughs> off the air <Airbnb. laughs> um but the queer community is not a united front and no one who's speaking about or for the queer community is mm -hmm. speaking for everyone yeah um and i think it's important to keep that in mind because we're not of a similar mind there's a lot of gay people who are homophobic, who a lot of gay people who are transphobic. Yeah. Um, and that's not a final state. For sure. Um, I think it's goes back to the idea of homophobia not being an insult or a, uh, a sentence. <laughs> sure. Yeah. It's not a, it's not a period on someone's like personality. Right. Yeah. Like that can be something that changes. Yeah. So, and, um, and I think, I think the reason I bring this up is because 
I've had it. I've had being gay compared to being a part of a religion quite often <laughs> in my in, in my own personal experience. Uh, someone someone else may not have experienced that, but but I feel that when speaking to a member of the church, they are trying to make sense of these things, and so they they project their understanding. Mm-hmm and say, well, I'm a part of this, this group that's a unified group. Uh, we, all, we all know what we believe um, in this group. And I see you part of this group. And so there's, a, there's this projection that happens in right. thinking that being gay is comparable to being in a religion mm-hmm. or that we believe the same things. Yeah, all of the same ideologies, right? Like the broad brush statements, all gay people hate religion or all gay, like stuff like that, right? Like that's not, yeah, yeah, that's not true. <laughs> and yeah, I think different that, colors of the rainbow, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's a reason why that's there's. That's we can't even agree on the flag. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. The flag doesn't seem to change every year. <laughs> well, we all have to have our own now. That's right. <laughs> and I don't, I'm not criticizing. Yeah, that. for sure. Um, I think it's good to. Fun. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think it's I think it's unfortunate when the comparison between religion and queerness is made because it goes back to what is an immutable characteristic and what is not. Right. Um, I think there's a case to be made that religion can become part of identity, mm-hmm. um, where you identify as ex religion. Um, and I think that's where the comparison can come from. Sure. But I still don't fully think it's entirely valid mm-hmm. because I can identify as straight all I want. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I tried for a very right. long time. Right. Um, and it just it just doesn't totally work because it's it's as 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 important as a religion is to a person's identity, it ultimately is a mutable characteristic i don't know what the opposite of immutable is <laughs> sure changeable yeah it's a it's a choice ultimately mm-hmm. whereas i think my experience and research has shown that being gay is really not changeable mm-hmm. sexuality is fluid you may change ever so slightly in the level of attraction that you feel to a certain gender but sure. it's it's not something that anyone up to this point knows how to control right and even if they did that doesn't mean being gay is wrong <laughs> there you go um okay so we're almost to the end of my things no, you're good. um temptations um being gay is frequently compared to being a temptation of some sort. And the way that the doctrine is structured, I can see how one may arrive at that idea. Um, But ultimately, I don't know if it's entirely comparable because frequently you hear being gay compared to, um, you know, being an alcoholic. I... (laughs) Can't tell you how many times I've heard this. <laughs> Jeez. Um, even to well, even coming from well-meaning people who know I'm gay, who know I'm mm-hmm. married, um, I've I've heard many many people compare me to an alcoholic, <laughs> um, and <laughs> obviously it's it's different because. With an addiction, that's something that you must first try to form sure. that addiction. Yeah, you can't become an alcoholic if you've never yeah. tried alcohol, right? Yeah, exactly. It's um, not quite the same with being gay, though. It's not like the first time you kiss a man is the time that you become gay, right? It's happened way before that point. Yeah. Is that what you're trying to say? Yeah, yeah, okay. exactly. Um, and and alcoholism has a negative connotation. Um, mm-hmm. I think that for me, 
what I personally like in, in comparison is comparing being gay to left-handedness. Okay. Because it's just a trait mm -hmm. that's a part of, in this case, your motivations and behavior. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it has an interesting correlation, I think, not correlation, that's the wrong word, but like uh, parallel mm -hmm. to being left-handed because um, the world didn't always accommodate left-handed people. It's a good point. And when the world started accommodating left-handed people, the amount of left-handed people rose drastically over the course of a generation. Mm -hmm. um, and then it leveled out at a certain percentage. Sure. Um, and I think that's what we're seeing with gay people and queer people mm -hmm. in general. And that's part of why I think the social contagion narrative is so nefarious because we see the rising statistic, right? And mm -hmm. it's like, well, obviously this is being spread throughout everywhere. Five years from now, hundred percent of the population is going to be gay or something, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah. Which is like, <laughs> it's ridiculous to, when you think about it, but it is the narrative that some people like throw out there and it's yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, I have seen it turn into a meme too, which, you know, poking fun at it. You may have to send that one to me. <laughs> I can't remember if I said it or not, but I swear, it's not like this rainbow graph. It's like, oh, by 2050, 80% of the population hit this rate. This stuff, yeah. So. Well, I mean, that is what we're secretly plotting. That's right. We just don't let you guys know. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's, there's just going to be an increase. And it's, it's because, being gay is becoming more socially acceptable. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was lucky to come out in the 2010s where, you know, it's significantly easier than uh, decades prior. Yeah, um, 1890, right? <laughs> and it's, it's only ever getting better in terms of, I don't want to say that, though. <laughs> sure. It's, it's, easier to come out than ever in terms of there's more support and more understanding mm -hmm. than ever. There you go. That's good. Um, but I don't, I don't want to say that it's easy because um, I, I haven't lived that experience of coming out post 2020, sure. um, post 2022 or, 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 or whatever. Um, and I wouldn't want to discount anyone's experience because they have their own experience and <laughs> generalizations are not <laughs> people's individual experience. Um, exactly. And so, yeah, um, the ease of coming out is going to make there appear that there's an increasing number of gay people. Right. Um, and, and, you know, who knows, who knows what that looked like in the past? Um, I don't know if we'll ever, know that specifically because um, of the decreasing availability of, well, that's a terrible way of putting that, <laughs> decreasing availability of older people. <laughs> it's not what I was expecting you to say. I don't know what uh, I was expecting. Just, but... just generations past, right. you know. Generations who knows, past. And... Who knows what their marriages look like or what they were experiencing. Mm -hmm. um, it's not like know. there was surveys going out 200 years ago that – talk about sexual orientation or yeah. yeah, gender identity and stuff, you know, so. Yeah. Um, and so I guess just a, just a couple more points to wrap up. I know that we, <laughs> no, it's good. We've kind of been over the place, but I like everything that we've talked about. Like, yeah. And again, these are just like my kind of observations of ways that I feel that I've encountered are things to watch out for or things to avoid. If you mm -hmm. want to be a, be a, productive ally who's supportive of someone who is queer in your life. Um, so uh, two, two more quick things. Sure. Um, defending homophobia. Um, I think there's a tendency among a lot of people when they see something 
negative to dismiss it. Uh, dismiss the bad thing that's happening. Mm -hmm. um, so when you see homophobia in your own community or in the world, um, and you have a gay person in your life who's reacting to that, or, or a person who is, is queer, who's reacting to that, and they're having feelings about that, for lack of a better term, don't discount that. Don't try to prevent them from feeling what is an actual natural re reaction sure. to the homophobia. Um, I, I wish I had an example off the top of my head of how this takes place, but ho hopefully that's clear enough of like something homophobic happens and people defend it. They're not ready to engage with it. People so, defend the homophobia is what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. I'm trying to think of an example as well. Um, I, I suppose if I could bring one recent out of the church, if that's sure. okay. Yeah, that's fine. Um, the, the talk that Elder Holland gave at BYU, um, in which he said that the, the faculty and staff uh, needed to use their metaphorical muskets in right. defense of of traditional marriage, traditional marriage, mm -hmm. church doctrine said that uh, Matt Easton had commandeered a graduation ceremony for his personal gain, essentially. Right. Um, Didn't he like just say that he's a beloved gay son of God? Mm -hmm. Like that was like the extent of like him coming out, right? Yeah, and, yeah, and to, as my, I'm aware. to my knowledge, he had permission to yeah to do that, which is which is why Elder Holland said that to the faculty and staff. Mm -hmm. He said, you guys are at fault for allowing this to happen. Right. You guys are at fault for allowing the moral foundation of this school to falter yeah. and to allow such a thing to happen. Um, and people that, were, and you're saying people were quick to defend other yes. actions, right? Yeah. That was, that was homophobia. Yeah. Um, regard and an absolutely terrible metaphor, too. Like, yeah. could you pick a worse one, in my opinion? I don't think I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> um, now, is it in line with the, 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 um, what the church believes? Perhaps. Was there a better way of going about that? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, there could have been a better way of doing that. And the way in which he did it was, was homophobic. Yeah. Um, and there was, there was a very quick defense of the situation and of other holy. Um, I wonder if we could talk that, just for a second about that. Like, why, maybe why does that happen? Why does what happen? Why, why are we so quick to defend something like that sometimes? Well, and, and I'm not just saying it's just Latter-day Saints defending what Elder Holland said, but like this goes all across, like, I think there's a couple of reasons, and and I didn't I didn't totally want to get into this example specifically because sure. I think its association with the church muddies the metaphor just a little bit. Okay. Um, the defense of Elder Holland is a little more predictable in that people have the church associated with it, and there's there's a defensive response in defense of the church. Mm -hmm. Um. So there, there is that aspect of that specific example. I think if you remove the church authority aspect of that metaphor and say it's a uh, uncle or a brother-in-law okay. or your your <laughs> grandpa, sure. uh, <laughs> I don't know that racist family member who shows up to everything. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, <laughs> or even a friend. Um, if you as a queer person have a problem with something that family member or friend says, the 
instant kind of major reaction, I think for a lot of people who may not be thinking, is to say, well, don't let it bother you, or don't, don't think about it. Yeah. Don't go too hard into it. You didn't mean it that way. Yes. Something like that, right? And on some level, I understand where this is coming from. Mm-hmm. I understand that this is an emotional response that this person's currently unprepared to deal with. They don't want to see you in pain. They don't want to be in pain. So their reaction is dismiss, deflect, and just move on. Right. The problem with that is that homophobia is real and queer people experience it. And by not allowing queer people to have a natural reaction to discrimination leveled against them, you're requiring that they bear the burden of homophobia alone. Yeah. And not being accountable for what was said, perhaps, you know. There's... I hope I'm not getting too critical here of the church in some ways, but the church and its leaders have a pretty good track record of not issuing apologies. Yeah. You know what I mean? And when they do, they're kind of half done, non-apologies. I've heard all kinds of things about it. And it's, that's something that's frustrating to me as an ex member. I'm sure it's frustrating to you as well because it's, they can do no wrong is what it comes across as ever. And yeah, we, but there's this teaching that we say in the church, like literally members say it all the time, the church isn't perfect. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I'm grateful that we say that. It's like, okay, now let's own it. Yeah. Just a little bit. Well, I mean, from the scriptures, it's it's okay for a prophet to repent. Right. It's okay. Yeah. We make mistakes. Yeah. I don't expect them to be perfect. But I do hold them to a little bit of a higher standard because of the claims that they do have for themselves. Yeah. And I think it would go so, so far to have some apologies for some major things. You know, the 2015 policy, Elder Holland and his talk. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the things that Elder Oaks has said. Et cetera. It goes back as long as the church is. And this isn't, I, something that frustrates me about this is like, well, other institutions do all this stuff kind of. It's like, okay, like, other bad behavior doesn't justify your bad behavior. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Well, I hadn't really thought about talking about this specifically, but like when I see people in in my life make homophobic comments, a lot of the times they just want to move on as if it didn't happen. Sure. And it's like, okay, you just want to move on and want me to carry with me what I know you believe about me. Right. Um, But if you're not going to discuss your beliefs and how they could have changed or how they have changed. How am I supposed to know that you have changed? Right. That you're not maintaining homophobic beliefs about me. Right. Internally what's going on behind the curtain. Yeah, I, I think it's super important both on an interpersonal level but also on an institutional level. Um yeah. Um, and so the last one, I don't think this is the most important, <laughs> but <laughs> the best wasn't for last. No, the best was not for last. <laughs> um, but it's just the idea of engaging in conversations with a, another, well, with a queer person. As, as a as a straight cis uh, person, engaging in conversations with queer people. Um, It, <laughs> the way that you talk to someone is important. Um, if you're asking questions, questions are fine. Um, 
and even some level of debate is fine. But when questions and debate are engaged in, in bad faith, when everything that the poor person says is on trial instantly, um, when their life experience is dismissed, when they are unable to speak for themselves or defend themselves against your skepticism, that's not being an ally. Right. Um, if you're coming to a discussion and saying things like, oh, well, we just don't have the, the research to know if interaction with a trans person can lead a child to become trans themselves, that's homophobic because we do actually have that research. But if you're saying the research doesn't exist, you're signaling that you're not interested in engaging with right. the research that does exist. Yeah. Um, so if you're engaging in a discussion in which the queer person is fundamentally unable to speak for themselves or defend themselves, then it's homophobia. It's not being an ally. It's not being understanding. It's not just asking questions. Right. It's a signal to that person that you are unsafe. Yeah. And that queer person may decide to distance themselves. And the heartbreaking thing about that situation is that queer people distance themselves from the family, families all the time. Mm -hmm. And they're frequently blamed for the low contact. Mm -hmm. Um, from, from my experiences, from hear, hearing the family talk about their gay brother or their trans sister, sure. uh, like, <laughs> going back to what we said earlier, oh, they used to be such a happy child, they have become gay, <laughs> and they cut themselves off. Sometimes. And they cut themselves off because we don't know why. It's mm -hmm. like, they're, they're, there's a reason. There's probably some reasons. There needs to be some conversations to, yeah. to disclose that. And and looking back on everything, you know, it's very possible that the the gay person or the trans person could have handled it better. But saying that they could have handled something better, it's not not really fair or or relevant because there's years years of baggage there. There's no rule book for this stuff, right? There's no rule book. And when you have years of debate and deflection and uh, invalidation, and that person breaks and says, okay, I'm taking a step back. Yeah. And then they get blamed, which is just the final nail in the coffin of gaslighting. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know what to say other than just don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. I think as we were talking, as you were talking about this, what came to my mind was, yes, this is happening with gay and queer people, but like also within other aspects, I see this as me as like a post-Mormon mm -hmm. and post-Mormons interacting with Believing Mormons and believing Mormons interact with post Mormons. It's all of this. There's a lot of blame. There's a lot of projection. There's a lot of fear. There's all these things that we're putting onto all these different groups because someone all of a sudden is different than us when maybe we thought before that they were the same. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, yeah. And that kind of is where we started the discussion is that a lot of these things involved with being allies to a queer community are really just about human interpersonal communication. Yeah. Like these things can happen anywhere. Mm -hmm. And the things that we talked about specifically are really prevalent in the, in the queer experience. Um, but it's just Really, we need to think about how we treat people yeah. in general. Yeah. Like, 
am I treating this person like a human or an opponent? Some sort of opposition to be beat in some sort of game of life, yeah. political game or religious game. How can I prove my ego, right? How can I prove yeah. what I know to be true is the truth? Mm-hmm. And that goes all over the place. So that's something I've really appreciated from this conversation and other conversations we've had on the show is that even though we're talking about maybe one specific thing, it applies to all other types of aspects, right? And that's not to diminish what we're talking about specifically for that day by any means, but sometimes, um, you know, at least me personally, like I don't know of currently any siblings or cousins aunts or uncles, like kind of like that part of my family that are LGBTQ, you Mm -hmm. know what I mean? So someone maybe in my situation would be like, oh, this this topic doesn't apply to me. But to that, I would say it's probably closeted people that you don't know, right? Statistically speaking, there's like 10%, right? (laughs) 10 to 20% somewhere in there um, of people fall into the LGBTQ category. And, but then also, you know, how does this maybe apply to other aspects as well. So, um, and I'm saying this at the end of the show. But, <laughs> um, this conversation. Oh, by way of introduction, yeah, you're exactly. talking about <laughs> gay issues and how to be an ally. <laughs> That's right. Well, Johnny, thank you so much for coming on and sharing what you shared. Um, this has been extremely powerful for me, and I hope that our listeners can feel like they're in the room with us right now as well. Yeah, just hearing the conversation and recognizing our own internalized homophobia, whether that was past or present, um, and how we can check that and change it. Because, as you said, like it's bad, but it's not bad. Uh, how did you say it? <laughs> it's bad, but it's something it's not that a, can be, it's not a sentence. It's not a sentence, right? <laughs> it's not. It's not a finality point on who you are or anything like that. And it almost doesn't even mean anything if you just recognize it. Right. Acknowledge it and let it go. Yeah. It was cool. Um, yeah, thank you for having me on. Yeah, of course. This has been great. Once again, guys, the, the book is Closeted. The author is Jonathan Alder. Oh, am I saying that right? Alder? Alder? Alder. Alder. Okay, perfect. Uh, but he goes by Johnny, and he'll let you know that in the book. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I will. <laughs> yeah, that's great. So we'll put a link in the show notes for where you can listen and or buy his book. And... Thanks again, Johnny, for coming on, and thanks, listeners, for tuning in. Yeah, thanks for having me. Of course.